All right, so uh, uh, welcome uh, to the uh, TSBC VP seminar. Yeah, uh, the, it's a pleasure to uh, have uh, Professor Timothy O'Reilly uh, for this week's talk. Right. So uh, uh, after studying mathematics, uh, Tim uh, did his uh, PhD uh, in uh, biophysics uh, uh, and uh, physiology, uh, and then the, after doing a postdoc uh, at the uh, uh, if mother's lab at the Brandeis. So that is lab uh, that works on the stomach gastric uh, ganglion, small network of uh, like around, around 30 neurons. And then uh, he moved on to uh, the Cambridge. Uh, and then he is currently a professor of, uh, uh, at the Department of Engineering. So uh, today he's going to talk about the fever control and variability uh, in the nervous system. So, Tim, please. Thank you. and. Um... Thanks for the informal demonstration of one of the downsides of feedback. Uh, we're going to be talking in this, uh, this talk mostly about the upsides of feedback and how it actually reconciles a large amount of variability and flux in the nervous system. So let me begin with an old idea. And I'm very aware that I'm talking to an interdisciplinary audience here. So if anyone is lost, please put your hands up and I can clarify, hopefully. Uh, online. So the old idea is that learning results from modifying connections in the brain. And this is probably familiar to you even through popular culture. Um, but you may not have seen what a synapse looks like. This is a diagram of a synapse. Uh, there's release of chemical neurotransmitter uh, from the presynaptic side and then the postsynaptic side senses that uh, and transduces a signal. And these connections are responsible for uh, maintaining the function of the nervous system. Now, when there's a modification to these connections, there's some kind of plasticity signal. I'm not going to go into detail in what that signal is. It might be an additional uh, um, neuroactive substance, something like dopamine. It might be actually a particular pattern in the neural activity itself that causes this change. Whatever it is, it leads to some sort of change in the strength and often the size of the synapse. And there's a few other things that you need to know. One is that synapses can enlarge. This is called potentiation. They can shrink. This is called depression. New synapses can grow. Existing ones can die away. And there's a limit, fortunately, to the size of an individual synapse. So these are sort of the key facts that you need to know about neural plasticity for this talk. So... Another idea that's supported by a lot of experimental evidence and also makes sense is that potentiation or any significant change to a synapse needs some kind of switch, a kind of threshold to engage the process. So what I mean by that is that in time, there's some kind of discrete plasticity signal, some event, something surprising happens in the external world. There's some kind of residual trace of this uh, event at the relevant synapses in the brain. This trace is held for a period of time during which the strength or synaptic weight increases over time. And this trace enables a bunch of biochemical processes to occur, uh, biosynthesis, insertion of receptors into the membrane, and even structural remodeling of the synapse. So all of these things occur because there's some kind of permissive signal that is triggered, okay? So here's a conceptual diagram of that. The plasticity signal causes some kind of switch and then we get growth. Now, how are such switch for, switches formed? Synapses are small biochemical compartments uh, and are therefore quite noisy. Uh, and there's been a tremendous amount of research in the last decades trying to identify the, the biochemical pathways that lead to these switches. One example of a candidate molecule molecular pathway is quite famous, it's called CAM kinase 2. It's an enzyme that sits close uh, to the receptors of the synapse and these enzymes sense uh, heightened activity and then are able to uh, undergo phosphorylation. They can phosphorylate themselves and others and this type of uh, trigger causes changes at the synapse and can lead to potentiation. And the, the model for this is very old. So this goes back decades uh, where we see that the net phosphorylation or activation rate of um, these enzymes 
becomes positive when calcium concentration exceeds the threshold, and it becomes negative when it is um, when the on enzyme uh, experiences a drop in calcium that is somewhat far away from this threshold, showing hysteresis in the activity. So this this model is based off a sort of conceptual uh, part conceptual model and some amount of, of biochemical data. Okay, so the basic idea is we've got these two states, an on state and an off state, and some sort of uh, mechanism that switches between them. And it's even possible to see this happening nowadays. You can see this happening in an individual uh, dendritic spine or synapse. So here, this little blob is a synapse. And at this point in time, the uh, experimentalists have triggered a surge in calcium mm -hmm. as well as a coincident uh, strong input to the synapse. And then what we see in pseudo color is the enzyme becomes phosphorylated, that's the red color, and subsequently the synapse physically grows in size over the life of the course of several minutes. So this is nice, right? Seems like it's the end of the story. But we found these kinds of switches, these enzymes, they seem to work as advertised. Unfortunately, it's very hard to dissect out these uh, biomolecular pathways. Uh, if one takes the isolated CAMK system, so the CAMK2 molecule purifies them and puts all of its friends in there together in a tube, uh, this system doesn't appear to exhibit hysteresis. So what do I mean by that? If we take the enzyme in its inactive state and ramp up uh, free calcium, then the enzyme activates. Uh, as it should. However, if we start with active enzyme and then ramp down calcium, it deactivates, but the proportion of active uh, um, subunits uh, overlays uh, these curves completely, showing no hysteresis. Okay, so this argues that this enzyme, at least when it's isolated from the rest of the synapse, doesn't really behave as a switch or it's very fragile. Okay, and these issues have, have dogged. Uh, or many attempts to uncover the molecular pathways that control synaptic plasticity. Um, so we entered the story at this point in time, uh, myself and the person who led this work, Monica Gyosha, um, and we went back to basics and we, we asked, okay, what makes a reliable microscopic biochemical switch? We brought put things right back to basics, forget specific molecules and so on. We're just going to think in generality. So let's start with this conceptual idea that there are two states, an on state and an off state. And let's cook up some generic uh, biochemical model of such a, a switch. So let's have two species. This could be inactive enzyme and active enzyme, or there could be two separate species. And let's cook up a plausible biochemical reaction that controls the rate of change of the state of this system. So here, uh, X is being inhibited by Y, uh, and Y is being mutually inhibited by X, okay? And those of you who have some biochemistry will recognize the form of these are just ill equations. So very straightforward uh, vanilla model. Now, the classical theory, and I'll say what I mean by that in a moment, says that we need two stable states in the system in order to have a switch, okay? It's almost a tautology. So if we plot the curves where the rates of these have uh, net zero, the so-called null fines, then if the, this exponent is, is two or higher, then we get several intersection points, okay? So we end up with, in this case, two stable states uh, flanking this unstable equilibrium. So we have a nice candidate for a switch. If we start the system near this, it will fall into the stable state. If we push it past this point, it will fall into this stable state. But here's like a switch. If, however, we take the same system and we take this exponent set it to one, this uh, very similar system now only has a single equilibrium. So this lets us play with a basic chemical, biochemical motif and play with the number of equilibria it has and ask uh, what happens. So one thing to point out is that this situation where there's this one stable equilibrium actually corresponds to the data I showed you earlier, 
where the equilibrium itself might move as a function of the amount of signal or calcium, but there is only ever one equilibrium. There's no hysteresis in the system. Okay. So I mentioned that this is a kind of classical model. What I really mean by that is that it's an approximation of what really goes on in a biochemical system. Synapses are small, about one micron cubed or smaller, and many molecular species at a synapse are present in low numbers. Okay. In particular, CAM K2, the one we talked about earlier, is present in 80 to 250 copies. Okay. And the reactions themselves are probabilistic. So what that means is that this nice, smooth, ordinary differential equation uh, mass action universe doesn't really apply, right? The dynamics instead are discrete and the states of the system hop according to various uh, probabilities, which are functions of the state of the system itself, okay? So this is the appropriate framework to model small systems. So what we're going to do now is take the same system, which has this one stable equilibrium and these mutual competing uh, species. Uh, and just to remind you, uh, when there's no cooperativity in this system, we, we just have this single stable equilibrium. So we're going to take this exact same system with the exact set of equations, and we're going to transport this now to the stochastic discrete world with the same parameters, the same rate loss. Okay. So here's what this looks like in the case where there are thousands of molecules present. Uh, what I'm plotting here is a probability density of where the um, states of this system, if you can think of them as concentrations of X and Y, where they sit in the X, Y plane, they kind of hover around in the vicinity of the stable equilibrium. And as you might expect, there's a bunch of fluctuations sort of buzzing around this equilibrium. Okay. So nothing too surprising, nothing too exciting either. It's just a noisy version of this uh, system that we have here. Now, what if we take this same system and we constrain it so that it doesn't have thousands of molecules, it instead has tens or hundreds of molecules? Well, this is what happens. So now we have a mode here, so concentration, high probability states here, and concentration of high probability states here, and very little going on at this deterministic equilibrium, okay? And just in case you fell asleep in the last few seconds, I'll show you again, this is the large system, has exactly the same dynamics as the deterministic case. And all we're going to do is constrain it so that there's fewer molecules, and we end up with this. So, What's going on here? Okay. What is going on? Well, the short answer is there isn't a good theory for this. Okay. So, uh, in a strict sense, I can say I don't know. Right. The mathematics for handling uh, these uh, discrete stochastic systems when they're nonlinear, frankly, doesn't really work. There's lots of approximate ways of studying these systems. One way to study them is to just simulate them and play around. Okay. Another way is to get a bit of intuition, and that's what I'm going to show you now. So the first thing to notice is that the world that this system lives in is no longer this smooth continuous space. It's, it's a lattice, right? I can't have half a phosphorylated molecule or half a molecule. I've got to have a whole number. So if all of the states sit on this discrete lattice. In particular, it's very unlikely that the stable equilibrium will sit on the lattice point, but that's a detail. So what difference does this, this coarseness of this system or this discreteness of the system make? Well, here's one observation and a piece of intuition I like for understanding why this system is fundamentally different. Let's zoom in on the region where we saw that uh, mode or that uh, concentration of states. Uh, what we notice is that the lines that demark where the net flux or net flow changes sign or changes direction, these start hugging the axis and they start lining up so that they actually fit close to or between lattice points, right? So what that means is that if we were on any of these lattice points and I've, I've drawn the flow field here in yellow, say we start at this point, well, there's a high probability, a net probability of 
flowing upwards and slightly out. But we could flow up several steps because the probability of flowing out is quite low. Okay. Similarly, on this side of both knot lines, there's a net probability of flowing down and a small probability per step or per unit time of flowing across. So this means that the system can get kind of trapped here for some period of time, flowing up, accidentally hopping across the null climb, flowing down, then accidentally hopping across again. Okay. Now I stress that this is just this is just an intuition, but it seems to pan out quite well, and it seems to uh, generalize a little bit to uh, systems that don't have this degree of symmetry. But in this case, the system is completely symmetric, so the same argument would apply here as well, right? So we have a possible explanation for why we get uh, this, this multimodality in this case. Regardless, what we have is a robust form of bi bimodality or stochastic bistability in these small systems. And the interesting thing is that this bistability is annihilated as the system grows in size, okay? Uh, so here for a small system, we have two modes, an on and an off, we could call them, and then as the system grows, it dissolves away, so we end up with our old uh, noisy equilibrium. And this has been known for some time, but what, what was less appreciated was that this system could act as a switch, and if it's coupled to growth, interesting things will happen, okay? What we went into in the paper, and what I'm not going to talk about today for time reasons, is that this does generalize to multiple species and to situations where the rates are not symmetric. And it turns out that this mutual repression, uh, mutual repression motif is, is fundamentally important for this behavior to occur. In any case, in, in this, uh, the yes. synaptic simulation, how long was that green time for each one? Right, that's, an, that's a nice question. So we have these different modes, but a very relevant question for this to be a reliable switch is how long will I hang out in a mode if I start there, and the answer is an arbitrary amount of time, I can tune the parameters of the system so that dwell time is arbitrary. Do you think there is only one bifurcation in the system or small In this case, no. For this system, because of the law of mass actions, as I scale up the size of the system, that equilibrium is going to become more and more. Uh, well, the fluctuations around it are going to shrink in a relative sense. Any more questions? It was a helpful question. Thank you. So going back to this discussion of synapses having this switch and then growing, we can ask, well, what will happen if we couple this to growth? And the answer is quite nice. Let's take the same system and let's label these states an on state and an off state. And let's I suppose there's a threshold for initiating synapse growth when we're in the on state. Well, as the synapse grows, it's now going to switch itself off at some point. So this will automatically prevent the system potentiating past a certain point because growth itself is coupled to the physics of how the system actually works. So we can have a synapse that starts to grow and then it kills its own switch once it gets past a certain point. Okay. So this we put forward just as a nice idea. What's nice about it is it works in spite of the fact that there's a high amount of uncertainty and noise in the system, that this exploits actually a transition in the physics of the system, not the quantitative properties of the system, it's the qualitative properties of the system that really matter. So what we learn from this is that these mutually inhibiting species can acquire stochastic switch like behavior in the microscopic limit. And if this is coupled to growth, this gives a novel type of feedback loop that can regulate synapse potentiation. So this is all speculative, but it might explain two ish decades of contradictory findings that maybe when one tries to reproduce what's happening inside these microscopic systems the size as well as the context and everything else might matter and might play a key role. Okay, so that was just kind of a, a warm-up story. I'm going to tell you three little stories today. That was the first one, and they are all connected, I promise you, but we're going to go from molecules all the way up to entire organisms.
looking at entire animals. That's my plan. Let's see how far we can. So in the remainder of the talk, we're going to ask how stable these synapses are in the long run. This is a question you should all be concerned about because uh, if you believe everything I've told you, these uh, synapses store your identity, your memory, your ability to function as a human being. And yeah, what? Is, sorry. That's yes. I think it's something uh, a question that I've had for a long time. Is, it, is there a simple way to do more in vitro experiments in time of culture? Complete in vitro. You mean outside of the cell, cell-free in vitro experiments? Yeah, or with a uh, test tube experiments you mentioned about with humans. In principle, I think so. Um, I think speaking, speaking, speaking to a clever microfluidics person would yeah. be the way to go. So there, there's nice uh, analogs of this. So the so-called um, BZ reactions, which are not organic reactions, they're inorganic reactions, but they're oscillators. There are examples of people confining those in bubble rafts in an, uh, an oil uh, and aqueous interface. So something like that. You could imagine you could do a clever biochemistry experiment and confine all of these ingredients uh, and titrate them so you end up with low copy numbers. Yeah. So yes, in principle, but I've never seen it done for these these particular molecules. But that would be the thing to do. Yeah. yeah. So how stable are synapses in the long run? That's something we're going to be concerned about. And are there any implications of all of this for neural circuits and behavior? Uh, physicists like to uh, point out a lot of the time, particularly statistical physicists, that once you zoom out and once you average out behavior, some of these fluctuations go away and they're not a problem. Okay? Unfortunately, biology doesn't always respect that. Okay? Biology is not you know, a ferromagnet or a piece of rock. Uh, sometimes the molecular events or the microscopic events actually matter a lot. Okay. So in answer to that first question, it turns out that synaptic connections in the mature brain seem to complete, uh, continually remodel, even when there is no apparent learning or change in behavior. All right? So this might come as a surprise. Here's some data uh, from a few years ago from Simone Rumpel's lab. And what they did was imaged the dendrite of an excitatory neuron, and they tracked these protrusions, which are the sites of excitatory synapses on these dendrites, over many days. And what they found is that some of the synapses hang around and change shape a little bit. Some of them disappeared and new synapses were born, even though in this case, the animal wasn't learning anything. It was doing something very boring. It was listening to two different tones associated with two different stimuli and doing that same task for weeks on end. Here's a summary of this data. Uh, when the spines are actually tracked and labeled over around two weeks, uh, something like half of the, pop the original population remains, and this is continually replenished on each day by new uh, dendritic spines, synaptic connections coming in and taking their place. So this is quite a lot of flux over the course of a few weeks, okay? Enough flux to be a problem. Um, so what you might ask, and a very sensible thing to ask, is that maybe there is something systematic going on here, right? The animal isn't frozen in time. It has a life possibly outside of the experiment that's being done to it, and it might be thinking about that life. So perhaps the brain is changing over time in a systematic way. Um, so there could be consolidation of existing memories, other types of metabolic housekeeping, etc. Regardless, one would expect then these changes to be the result of some kind of systematic plasticity signal of the type that we were discussing earlier. So uh, an obvious thing to do is to try and block these plasticity signals and see if it has any effect on this frenetic spine turnover. It turns out that some experiments were done of this nature that attempted to arrest this continual change by blocking the component or by correlating the change to other uh, physiological variables. And this is what we've seen. So here's an older experiment uh, this is in, in culture, uh, cultured neurons, where um, the remodeling is tracked over time. And then in uh, control conditions, there's a large amount of remodeling over several hours. 
And when activity is blocked by uh, applying the toxin to the culture, the amount of remodeling slows down for sure, but it doesn't disappear completely. A significant amount of that. Doing things a different way, trying to actually regress the changes in uh, synapse with uh, other processes in a statistical sense, only was able to account for um, a uh, less than half of the total change uh, attributing it to some, some kind of systematic signal. And this isn't just something that uh, one group has seen in neuronal cultures. This has actually been seen in intact animals as well. Obviously, it's very hard to interfere with these pathways, and people have to come up with very clever ways of trying to block the plasticity but leave other things constant. So all of these things are subject to caveats. But what's interesting is just how consistent these estimates are, mm -hmm. that the amount of turnover that seems to be due to a systematic source is always less than half of the total amount of turnover. Okay, so consistently less than 50% of ongoing synaptic changes seem to be due to these systematic signals. So this seems like a small proportion. Why so much of it is apparent fluctuation? Uh, is it just measurement problem? Could be, but for now, we're just going to take these results uh, at face value. Uh, and what we're going to claim is that this proportion is actually optimal for maintaining a limb behavior. That seems a bit silly. Okay. The amount of systematic change is less than half of the total change, meaning that the total change is largely unsystematic. How can that be? Well, if this isn't obvious to you already, if this seems mysterious, I promise you in a few minutes, you're going to be annoyed because it will seem obvious. At least that's what I hope. Okay, so what I'm going to show you next are some simulation results that corroborate this claim and some intuition of the mathematics behind the result itself. And this was work led by my former postdoc, Drew Varaman, who's now faculty at the University of Sussex. Okay. So what we want to do to tackle this question is cook up a general learning and memory model. So we would like a network of neurons. We'd like them to be attempting to learn some task via some type of form of plasticity, some type of learning. And in a very general setting, you might think, well, it's hard to say anything specific about the type of data we've just been looking at. What we really need is an extremely general uh, modeling framework. Okay. In particular, we'd like to know, you know, what type of tasks we consider. We don't want to be particularly constrained, so we'd like to consider all tasks. All right. So how are we going to do that uh, for some generic uh, neural network? Um, well, first of all, we want to consider all tasks that this network can actually solve. Okay. So what we did was we borrowed uh, a very clever idea that's used in the connectionist network community, these days known as the AI community, um, where we take two identical neural networks, identical in structure. We take, call one of them the teacher, and we fix random connection weights in this, this network. We call another one the student, and these are the connections that are plastic, they can change, they can be adapted. And we just feed random inputs into the teacher and get input output pairs. Okay. So this teacher just generates data that the student now attempts to learn. For any given input, this uh, teacher gives an output, and then the student, when given that same input, its goal is to try and produce the same output. Now we know in principle that there's a configuration of weights that will allow the student to do this because it's got exactly the same architecture. Okay. Not only that, we have uh, access to unlimited amount of data to train these neuron uh, these networks. All we need to do is find an appropriate learning rule by which to train the student. Okay. And here there's a, another problem, and that is that we don't know which learning rules the brain actually uses. Okay. Because after all, we want to relate this back to, to biology. So, what kind of learning rules would we like to use? Well, again, we don't want to pen ourselves in, so we'd like to consider all possible rules. How are we going to do that? 
Well, for simulations, we consider all possible learning rules up to first order. What does that mean? What that means is that we will model learning on some time interval as imperfect gradient descent. Okay. So the picture you should have in your head is that the uh, performance of the network can be quantified in terms of its error. And the error as a function of all of the different weights forms a complicated landscape with hills and valleys in it. And learning corresponds to descending one of these valleys to a low point. Okay. How do you get down a hill? You can follow the, the path of steepest descent. It's not always the best idea, actually. It turns out there's better ways to do it. But locally, over some time interval, anything that gets you from high error to low error can be approximated by a gradient step, plus some other stuff if it's not a very good learning rule. So this gives us a recipe for cooking up a family of learning rules all the way up to perfect gradient descent, which some people argue the brain might be able to do. We're not sure, we're agnostic about that. All the way down to a learning rule that's no, not much better than random noise, jiggling the weights around and occasionally moving in the right direction. Okay. Good. So we now have a way of decomposing changes in synaptic weights into uh, a systematic component. So this is going to come from our approximate gradient descent rule. And then a fluctuation, which is just going to be a random disturbance to these weights. And we're going to be interested in how the steady state error, so that's the error that this network settles down to uh, when it's finished learning, um, on the relative magnitude of the systematic, the fluctuating components. Because going back to the experimental data, the a cartoon version of what happened was that the experimentalists blocked this and then all they were left with were these fluctuations. So what we're able to do because we can control these things independently is look at how the steady state error depends on the relative strength of each of these. Any questions at this point? Because I've covered a lot of uh, bits and pieces. So either Everyone's on the same page, or some people are so hopelessly lost they can't be bothered to ask a question. But that's so for the output, uh, you use the older neural to switch to more simple Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, the task error is always computed for, for the input output to the whole network. Uh, so there are some uh, hidden neurons saying that. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So here's the result, the numerical result. This is the steady state error as a function of the strength of the plasticity relative to the fluctuations, okay? So I'm just taking the magnitude of this relative to the magnitude of this, plotting that on the x-axis. And what you see is when these things are roughly equal, which is where the yellow and green uh, regions meet, the steady state error is approximately minimal. Okay. If the systematic uh, component gets stronger, the error starts to creep up. If the random component gets stronger, the error starts to creep up again. Yeah. Okay. So this seems to agree in spirit with what we saw uh, in the data. And what's nice about the setup is we can modulate the quality of the learning, make it more and more accurate, and we can change the overall magnitude of fluctuations. So changing the fluctuations doesn't really have much effect on this relationship. Interestingly, increasing the quality of the learning rule shifts the minimum to favor an even smaller proportion of systematic plasticity. Okay, so if you've got a good learning rule, you don't want too much of it. You actually want to let the fluctuations dominate. Right. Let, let the synapses do their thing and they'll occasionally prod them and get them to go in the right direction. But why is that? Okay. Why? What's going on? So this is the part where you're going to think this is obvious. Um, and I'm just going to give the intuition in a, in a specific case. So let's imagine we only have one synapse and we have an error curve that looks like this. Right? Error is low at the bottom. This is where we've learned things first. And we're going to consider the result of 
modifying our synapse according to a, a random component and then a systematic component that's going to bring us down the gradient of the ferrocytes. So let's suppose we start at the bottom, fluctuation comes along and it knocks us up the slope. Now ask how big should our, uh, our uh, compensatory response be to fix the error that's been caused here? And the answer is it should be equal and opposite because if it's any larger, we'll create up the other side of the slope. Okay. Now this actually holds more generally. Okay, but the picture changes slightly as we increase the number of synapses or the uh, dimension of the problem. So I'm going to give you now a little bit more intuition in a high dimensional case. Let's suppose now we have three synapses. Uh, constrained so that error is low in this kind of two-dimensional surface. Right? So inside this surface, we have functional uh, circuit configurations and outside it, things are not so good. Well, if we again perturb so that we're outside of this, the systematic plasticity is, is its goal is to take us back onto the surface. Now, what's the shortest path back to this surface? Well, the, the Noise components pushed us in some random direction. An efficient systematic component is going to take a beeline straight back down to the surface. Right? So it's going to take, uh, in general, a shorter path to get back to that surface as determined by this right angle triangle. And if you do the math, and it's high school math, and you ask on average what this ratio is, about 61%. Right? So this is the ratio of the magnitude of this fluctuation relative to the uh, short part of this triangle, the systematic component. And that's quite nice because this ratio seems close to at least some of these estimates. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. So this all is a steady state analysis so this is in, under conditions we're assuming that there's no net learning going on and uh, uh professor Foucault is right to point out that if we're in a state where actually the animal is not learned this is no longer true and that is is no longer the case in an unlearned state the systematic component should dominate but all of the data that we're looking at here is at least nominally at some type of steady state so that's a very important point so, um, conclusions for this part. So the experimental evidence seems to suggest that less than 50% of synaptic reconfiguration is driven by systematic changes at some type of baseline steady state. And to optimally maintain function, the systematic component should not outcompete fluctuations. And this is independent of the learning law. And this high amount of turnover in turn suggests that there's many spares of de degrees of freedom in neural circuit connectivity. Right? The fact that these things can wander around, reconfigure, and then the circuit can find some way to fix them without sending everything back where it started suggests there's a huge amount of degrees of freedom, which again shouldn't be a big surprise. But this has interesting implications. Okay. And in the final part of the talk, I'm going to talk about what these implications are. So let's go back to this picture where we are hanging out inside this space, this curved space of circuit configurations where things work nicely. And some kind of ongoing learning or feedback or interaction with the world, internal or external, something is pulling us into this subspace. Okay. Well, if there are many degrees of freedom, many spare degrees of freedom and room to move inside this surface. Then generically, if there's any disturbance at all, any amount of noise in the system, for example, we're going to experience drift within this circuit. So the circuit configuration itself is just going to change over time. Okay? It can't not do that in a sec. So this picture, if it's really true, if all that's happening is that the feedback is pushing in a general direction and not trying to restore a former state or keep a synapse sort of frozen, 
then this predicts a huge amount of variability and some drift in the circuit configuration over time. So the obvious question is, is there any experimental evidence of this? Uh, and if so, is it possible to actually manipulate this phenomenon? Right? We've got a certain type of dynamics here, which is somewhat related to ongoing learning. That gives us a window into how the brain uh, reconfigures and maintains information in the long run. Okay, so for this, I'm going to turn to some experiments that were done a few years ago by our collaborators, in particular by Laura Driscoll, who was um, a PhD student at the time with Chris Harvey. So what Laura did was she set up the following experiment, where there's a mouse housed in a virtual reality environment with an optical window that allowed her to measure the activity of large populations of neurons in the brain using a calcium indicator. So she could literally watch neurons light up as they were firing. And this virtual reality environment allowed her to uh, design a task that the animal could solve. Uh, it's a fairly simple task. So the animal has to run down this virtual maze, turn left or right. And if, if um, the left versus right decision is associated with uh, a wall pattern. So if the animal sees uh, black dots on a white background, it needs to go left. If it sees white dots on the black background, it needs to turn right. And if it gets the right answer, it gets the reward. Okay. Very boring. Animals can do it very well. And they learn this to expert level in a few weeks. So what Laura did was take those animals that had learned this task, that were performing at steady state, no obvious behavioral change, and asked what was going on uh, in the activity in a particular region of the brain. And the region of the brain she was interested in was called the um, posterior parietal cortex. Those of you who are not neuroscientists don't need to pay attention to this. All you need to do is think of it this way. Um, you might be aware that there are parts of the brain that are involved in direct, uh, direct um, muscular activity or motor output. There are other parts of the brain that are sensory regions. They receive signals coming in. PPC is neither of these. Right? So it's a circuit that's sort of embedded somewhere in the middle of the brain and what it represents is therefore a little bit more abstract it's not directly related to sensory or motor signal okay and it turns out that if you lesion ppc or block it animals can learn and perform this task okay so it's an important chunk of the brain for solving this task so here's what she found um, importantly the ppc activity actually represents the task in some sense so there's a correspondence between where the neurons are maximally active, and that's what's being plotted here in this color code. So yellow is where each of these cells, each cell is a row, and the x-axis is where is the position of the animal in the mix. So there's a whole bunch of neurons that are lighting up when the animal's at the start, and then as the animal progresses through the, ta uh, through the task and through the maze, a different subset of oh, neurons becomes active. Okay, so this is nice. And incidentally, she, she designed this task because what she wanted to do was acquire a baseline and then train the animal to do something different and see all of this change. Unfortunately, that's not quite what happened. 10 days later, keeping the cells sorted in the same order, this is what she sees. Right? So the activity is somewhat disorganized. And this disorganization continues uh, showing a drift in the activity pattern over day. Now, it's not just the case that the neurons have become less active, because on any given day, if she goes back in and reorders the cells, she's able to find this, this nice representation of the task again. So somehow, this association between neural activity and what the animal is doing is evolving in time, gradually, over a period of several days. So, we don't know why this is, but one thing uh, that I, I'd like to ask you to think about is how neural circuits might cope with this. Um, this is something that we looked into in a, in a very sort of simple way, and I'll quickly mention that. Um, you could imagine that there are many possible configurations, because there's so many degrees of freedom. It might be possible to extract or read out the information from this in spite of the fact that things are changing. And the answer is that's almost true, okay? 
So what we found, and this is work by Michael Rule and Adriana Lobach, is that it's possible to decode what the animal is doing uh, simply by taking the neural activity in this population and decoding it through a model. Well, what type of model do we use? The simplest one you can think of, just a linear model. So plain old linear regression can actually reconstruct the trajectory of the animal by taking enough cells. And if you look at the structure of this activity, a bit of intuition should say why. The neurons behave almost like little basis functions that encode what the animal is doing at any point in time. So a linear weighted sum of these basis functions tells you, can give you a decent estimate of what's going on. Another motivation for a linear decoder is that that's kind of what neurons and circuits do. So you could imagine uh, another uh, a neuron that's connected to the cells in this population taking weighted sums of what's going on, and then it's able to reconstruct some estimate and use the information that's present in the circuit. Okay. So anything that's a problem for a linear decoder might also be a problem for another part of the brain. Okay. Conversely, if we can easily read out the information using a linear decoder, there's no reason why the, the rest of the brain shouldn't be able to do it either. Okay. I mean, and we can. So this should be positioned. Yeah. About the behavior data. Um, can you go back to the two slides? Yeah. Where to? Um, here. Day one, day ten, day twenty. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any data? Yes. So day one is the beginning of the training. Is that the no. Uh, this is at. This is several weeks after training, after okay. a month when they've reached a criterion of performance. The performance is flat throughout this time. Have you imaged the activity during the course of the learning? They they have looked at this. Yeah, I, I didn't do this work. This is okay. work by uh, Laura. A but... Similar degree of the drifting compared to after identical. We don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> but people are looking at that, and that's an important question. Naively, we'd expect a lot more reconfiguration to go on during the learning phase. Yeah. Okay. And behavior stage. What is learning stage? Yes. Yeah. So the behavior is at criterion here. It's basically they're performing ninety-five percent the whole time. Nothing interesting going on. Mm -hmm. okay. How, how, how many, like, within the same day, uh, like, how many different types of behavior do you see? There's a small amount in a single day. Yeah, but the largest amount occurs between days, which is interesting. So it could suggest that sleep is involved and a bit of time, and in fact. It seems that both time and experience jointly determine how much the, the code evolves. And that's been seen in other parts of the brain as well. So this is not the only part of the brain where this type of phenomenon is observed. Yeah, there's a question is related to this idea of different parts of the brain. Mm -hmm. Do different parts have the same like, amount of drift? Like, you... No, they don't. And that's interesting as well. So that's something we could pick up at the end. Right? Yeah. Okay, so how do, um, uh, where was I? Right, we, we have this neural, uh, this uh, linear decoder. This allows us to reconstruct what the animal's doing. We can pull out its location, its velocity, and its heading in the maze. So this is not. And unsurprisingly, if we build this linear decoder and then we fix the parameters and then test that same decoder on subsequent or previous days, it doesn't do so well because there's drift going. Okay. But this raises an obvious question. There's a huge amount of redundancy in this code. Okay. We're only reading out a small amount of information from a large number of cells. Can we find a drift invariant set of weights? Right. How might we do this? Well, an easy way is to take data from multiple days and try to build a model that can predict as well on any given day. And the answer is it kind of works. So a concatenated decoder does not perform. Uh, it, it's statistically always worse than uh, a decoder that's trained and used on that same day. Worse still, even when you do this, and this is this is challenging statistically because there's limited data, but our best estimate was that you will get a degradation of a concatenated decoder no matter how much of a subset of data you actually use. So what this tells us is that the drift is, is going on in a way that doesn't completely destroy the decoder, okay? 
It's not as destructive as it could be. So for example, if we had completely random drift, the decoding performance would degrade far more rapidly. So there's some sort of constraint, but it's not constrained into a perfectly linear subspace, right? So the drift is not occurring in the kernel of some linear decoder. It's not as nice as that. However, um, it is far more systematic and constrained than you expect by chance. And an obvious question then is what's constraining it? Is it the behavior and the continual learning that the animal's doing that's constraining where this neural activity resides? We'd expect it to be. But an obvious thing now to do is to try and manipulate the behavioral feedback. In order to do that, we asked if we could actually decode the behavior from the PPC activity in real time. We were working with offline data where we fit a linear model. And this is a big model, right? There are hundreds of neurons and there's many minutes of data um, sampled at a fairly high resolution. So it can be challenging to actually get a decent fit in a certain amount of time. But because it's a linear model, there are nice methods for doing this. Moreover, because it's a linear model, we don't need to isolate individual cells in an Im imaging frame. If the imaging frame is steady enough, then it contains the signal plus some other nuisance component as well. So by linearity, we can train directly on pixels or super pixels of this uh, um, imaging frame, build a decoder, and then again, recover what the animal's doing. Now, why would we want to do this? The answer is that we can now potentially manipulate the feedback so that the neural activity itself drives the behavior. So in summary, what we're attempting to do is we have this situation here where the PPC is involved in controlling behavior of this virtual environment. We want to shortcut this or to eliminate the motor output, so disconnect the control, the physical control of this VR decode directly from this part of the brain and use that to drive the VR. Why? Because this should now operate as a different constraint for the activity in PPC, and it should evolve differently than in the physical case. In particular, our conjecture is that this will maintain the performance of a linear decoder far greater than chance. Okay, So here's where we've got with this. Um, and this was work of my PhD student, Ethan Sorrell, working with the postdoc in Chris's lab, Dan Wilson. So they set up the same thing, except this time they have a, a real time decoder. And without the mouse knowing it, they can switch between physical control of the VR or brain machine interface control of the VR. And this is what it looks like. So here's a comparison to the physical interface and the brain controlled interface. The animal is running down the linear portion of this maze. It reaches a turn and then turns left or right. And if you look at trajectories of these animals, it's very hard to tell the difference between the brain control case and the physical case. Now, the brain control case is not quite as good. The animal definitely figures that something's up, something's a bit strange here. The performance is not quite the same, but it's good enough to study what happens in the long run. And so far, what we've found, and the broken lines show this, is that even with a fixed decoder over several days, we don't get the drop in performance that we'd expect from offline data, which is interesting. Okay? We haven't done this long enough or across as many animals as we need to to make strong conclusions, but this is promising. And another interesting thing is that the activation of the neurons, what's being shown here, as a function of location in the maze is where individual cells are most active, that there's a difference between the BMI case as shown in blue and the physical case as shown in black, okay? So there's certainly some contextual difference that the animal detects when it's operating in this BMI case. But that contextual difference is not enough to completely destroy decoding of the task, okay? So on a short time scale, there's a big change in activity in PPC, but it's compatible with this linear decoder. On a longer time scale, what we're interested to see is does this actually shape the evolution of the neural code as we predict it would. Okay. Um, so I'm going to 
It's, it's parent state. Yes. So there's no history. It's it's a it's a static decoder actually. It's a... Okay. So when the mouse comes to the turn junction, mm -hmm. so how can you uh, apply control? So you will uh, use the current set before the decoder and yeah. the user feedback. Yes. Okay. So that just means that. Neural uh, activity in some of our cases, we see the uh, current actual. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So there's something probably a bit unnatural about this that the the change in the virtual re reality environment somewhat anticipates a little bit what the animal is actually doing. Uh, so we don't know what the appropriate lag would be because when we looked in the data. There wasn't a, a detectable optimal lag between the activity and the behavior. If you go back in time, you can always reconstruct from a history what's going on, but that's not a surprise. But it wasn't obvious that there was a, a sort of obvious uh, peak in predictive power between TPC and behavior. Yeah. And some of that could be a limitation of calcium indicators as well, because they do have the, the sort of uh, temporal smoothing effect on neural activity. Yes, we didn't freeze freeze movement. What's interesting is the, the animal's physical movement starts to deviate from what it should do. So that there's a gradual mismatch occurring between the animal's stereotype movement and then its actual motion in the maze. So they start to decouple a little bit. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do now is to slow down the animal's movement by physically breaking the ball to see if we can decouple the two things. Do you know if the PPC activity has something like two or three pointers in hippocampus? In yeah, I don't know. Case, I don't like, know. Like a, mm. like a period yeah. of time to contain future trajectories. Yes, I, I don't know actually. I don't know whether you get these little episodes that predict the animal's intention. It'd be interesting if you do. So we're actually working with uh, Yulia Kupek uh, who's, and doing the same thing with uh, to, to possibly get at those things, mm -hmm. but it's very hard with uh, optical methods. Okay, so let me quickly summarize. I can take a few more questions after that. So in this part, uh, I talked about decoding signals directly from PPC, and this actually allows these animals to control movement in virtual environments. Interestingly, the neural activity differs slightly from the BMI in the physical case. This is something that's seen in, in traditional BMIs as well, that we use the motor cortex as well. Um, so that, that's actually consistent. Interestingly, the fixed decoder seems to perform stably over several days, at least so far, despite possible changes in neural activity. So that brings me to the end, and hopefully, You've seen that the thread here has been that there is a large amount of ongoing change at every level in the nervous system. And that observation by itself is very hard to reconcile with anything coherent going on. But when you put feedback into the picture, you start to realize that a huge amount of reconfiguration can happen as long as there is a minimal amount of feedback uh, keeping things going. So I'd like to thank all of the wonderful people that I've met and worked with over the years. It's an, uh, a real privilege to be among young, creative, smart people uh, as my nine to five job. Um, the people here, so Monica, Druva, Michael, um, Charlie, Ethan, uh, and Adriana were directly involved in the work that I talked about today, as were these collaborators. I'd also like to thank uh, Jonas and Lynn for uh, hosting me while I'm here and making sure that everything's uh, worked so smoothly. The TSVP committee for allowing me to come here in the first place, and of course, Oist and yourselves uh, for supporting this visit and for listening to me talk for an hour. So I can take more questions now. Thank you. Thank you.
Has there been any experimental work? So this is about the spine variable. Is there any experimental work that has been able to look at uh, how much of the spine turnover helps to turn over in the synaptic oh. um, input? Yeah, and I don't know. That number, uh, and for your model, if that yeah. number was particularly low, what do you think that would be for your model? Like, if it actually, if, if the, when the spine goes away, yeah. it looks like the yeah. right? But yeah. then the same axle goes back. Yeah. So I think what, yeah, so what you're asking is, is there essentially um, a persistent available input? And then the spines that are turning over are just passing the baton between each other and, and maintaining connection with the same input. I, I suspect that's actually not the case for the simple reason that when you look at the turnover and uh, on a single dendrite, these spines are appearing and disappearing in very distal parts that then So it could be the case that an axon snakes along and uh, makes contact in several places as does happen quite a lot. But it doesn't seem to be the case that the turnover is just a zero sum game at individual synapses. But I, I don't have a, a systematic uh, data set that speaks to that. And I'm not aware of anyone having gathered one. The, the last bit, I think, was super interesting to manipulate the drift and the ionic state situation. But I wasn't sure how that uh, addressed the, the failure of the linear decoder in the actual situation. Right. Yeah. So I think what happens, and this again, it, subject to it being preliminary data, we haven't run this for a whole month. Right? So we don't know what will happen in the long run. Um, but I think that. When the animal is actually in closed loop, it's able to correct for minor deviations from what's happening, right? So it intends to move forward. It kind of moves forward, but with a bit of a deviation. Well, it will correct to that. And as long as those corrections don't destabilize the overall loop, okay? In other words, as long as they're modest and the controller doesn't amplify them, which a linear controller could do in certain circumstances, then you'll get graceful, if slightly suboptimal um, control of the BMI interface. It's a little bit like if um, I was to mess with your mouse pointer and each day I slightly rotate the X, Y without you knowing. On that day, you'll come in and you'll think, oh, you know, what's going on? But you'll very quickly adapt. Uh, that you can't, you, you can't mimic that situation in offline data, okay? So I think what's going on, if there is this substantial change in this case, right, is that the animals continue uh, adapting. And then the question is, does that adaptation show up in the trajectory of the drift? So it's almost like uh, forcing a form of ongoing latent learning um, and then looking at how the population activity evolves uh, in, in, in its presence. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I have a question about some sort of uh, biological kind of pain or driver for uh, this spine turnover or frustration. Um, of course, some sort of like maintenance for the frustration to be taken place. Uh, but at the same time, especially in the case of hippocampus or higher collective brain area, it's more of uh, uh, automatic encoding system. They're incorporating new information mm -hmm. constantly. And in your final experiment, where animals doing the virtual reality and have, as you imagine, the animal is kind of living boring life outside yes. of the past. Yeah. What if you introduce another task while you introduce your uh, virtual reality mm -hmm. task? And introduce other structure changes, which is quite different in nature uh, from um, maintenance purpose. Yes. Yeah. Turnover. Do you expect the representational drift being qualitatively different? Yeah. Uh, from what you have observed and recorded in your experiment. Yeah. So, um, and I, I should mention, I'm not physically doing these experiments. Yes. Yeah. 
it's Dan and Chris at Lab who's, who's very kindly uh, offering his time to do this. Um, what you'd expect from the, the theoretical point of view is, so let, let me re repeat what you, you've suggested. Instead of doing this fairly mundane task day in, day out, that doesn't really use up resources, neural resources, what if suddenly the animal had more of a challenge? Okay. Mm -hmm. And had to do an auxiliary task or a variant of that task or something more complex yeah. each day. How might that affect the trip? Yeah, or well, completely different task in addition to the yeah. other reality. So, so the um, purely theoretical answer to that is drift is occurring in spare degrees of freedom. If you reduce the number of spare degrees of freedom, as you should, if you've increased the complexity of the task or added an additional task, the drift can now only occur in a, a, a lower dimensional space. Okay. Yes. So that should actually be detectable. Mm -hmm. If if the drift resembles something like a, a, a Brownian motion in this subspace, if you change the dimension of the subspace you change the mean squared deviation yeah. of that of that random walk as a function of time. So you should actually be able to detect it. And what you should see is the mean squared deviation drop yeah. as the complexity of the task increases. So that's the naive yeah, it's, it's, vanilla answer to that. I think it's an interesting prediction. We should yes. Test that yes. Increase. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, yeah, and, and well, <laughs> Chris, Chris's his lab has, has considered this, and we've, oh, yeah. we've sort of considered this. It, it's, it's something that's quite hard to do um, because it's not obvious that the animal, one of the problems I foresee with this is you really get a limited amount of time where an animal's engaged and motivated to actually do anything. And that tends to equal the amount of time that you need to gather the data. So you have to design this in a very clever way, possibly so that the animal being monitored in its own cage but with something that's mobile mm -hmm. to, to actually do that. But yeah, that, that is, it's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, I, I gotta go to pick up my kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's continue the discussion. Sure. Uh, and then, yeah 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 so that that's a nice idea and it's it's again something that's a, it's on this ever-growing list of things to try out is now that we have this decoder, we can mess with it and we can apply transformations to that decoder to see does it have any effect on the PPC activity on the long or the short term? Uh, the yeah. Maybe. Yes. Maybe, maybe. And there's probably very clever uh, transformations that we could do. Um, that are task dependent as well, that maximally use the neural activity that's available. So yeah, it, it opens really, this is a proof of principle, but it opens the way to doing all these types of, of manipulations, yeah. Okay, so I think that will be more questions and discussions, but uh, I want to take a step, let us close the uh, show, that's it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.